The video will begin after these four images. Feel free to pause at any point during the video during the still images to get a better look. Here we are at the approach to the front of the wigwam I built and lived in through a winter and spring into the current moment, which is July. Let's get a little closer and I'll talk about it more. So you might also call this inspired by a wiki up or bender. Wigwam is the most common word I know and it was, I believe it was native to this area, um, which I should say is southern Vermont. But I'm not too sure of the exact wording. But the idea is that you have tree saplings and push them into the ground. Maybe pound stakes in first to make holes, remove the stakes and push the poles in bend them over into kind of a half circle where they join each other and lash them together. So that's what I did in this case and I followed an instruction. So I built this for about a hundred dollars worth of materials, did some scrounging. A lot of the materials were free and bought the clear plastic and some of the rocket mass heater materials inside, like ducting and fireproof insulation. I had the pond liner and the rest was made with, um, the frame was red maple saplings and uh, lashed together with basswood inner bark I peeled and spruce roots that I dug up. And then around this door, which is a double window, opens from the bottom and top to prevent, um, to make a rectangle and prevent air drafts, I used cattail stalks and marsh reed, the Phragmites reed. Um, which I gathered in December, and they're fastened or end tied with yucca leaves. It's a double frame, so the inner frame has a 12 foot diameter, and that's the living space inside. The outer frame is, and that's covered in sheets, um, tied and weighed down. And the outer frame is 15 feet, covered in this translucent builder's plastic. In between is a foot and a half thick of dried leaves, an enormous amount. And that worked great as insulation through the winter. As the weather's warmed up, it started decomposing, and just gravity has made it settle, I believe. And um, there's gaps, but that could be refilled. You know, maybe blankets or other things would be better, but this was available and close by. That was kind of the theme of this project, was to do something with largely natural materials, or materials that are also simple and reusable, and very inexpensively, like I said, only $100, and to be very comfortable, very comfortably have shelter through a winter here in Vermont, where it got to negative 20 degrees a few times, was often below freezing, and you know, there's, there's some deep snow that can happen here. I'll show some pictures of that. I was very comfortable inside, I could cook, and what else is there to say? It was simple, it has a dirt floor, but I loved it. This was an easy site to build this on because it's a river sediment and like 95% sand, so it was very easy to pound stakes in, and then remove those stakes to put the frame poles in. I also dug down a little bit, as you see, for the entrance, and then it's a little deeper inside in some parts, and having this kind of insulated dome over the earth, I was tapping into the roughly 40 degrees Fahrenheit heat of the earth, and 
even when it would get to negative temperatures outside and be that way for days on end, it would not drop below positive 35 in there. Which is livable, you know, survivable. Not the most comfortable, but at least you're not dropping to the ambient outside temperature. Now with the heater I have inside, which I'll show you, it was able to get much warmer than that and stay that way for hours. Up top here is a, I made a little cone open on one side of sticks and that sh has EPDM pond liner over it at the most you know, important part, the top, and the most susceptible area to leaks because there's the least slope there um, and water is easier to get in. So I use that thicker um, membrane up there and out of that comes the exhaust of my rocket mass heater. It's six inch diameter ducting. And it's cool. It's only, you know, it gets no higher than 110 degrees Fahrenheit by the time it's, um, it's going vertical, so it, it can't burn things up. I weighed down the outside with rocks. The plastic's just tied down with um, ropes, which are, and so with the EPDM liner is also fastened down with ropes, and the weight that all those ropes are tied to are buckets and crates of rocks. So I'll go around the side to give you a side view. Here was my window, so to speak. This is a square about that size, did not have leaves in it. There's leaves, stuffed leaves between the two frames below it, to the sides, and above. But I made kind of an alcove here, and um, it's translucent, and the white sheets are on the inside. Um, some cool air could get through there, but that was also my natural light source. I have electricity, as you can see here, from my landlady's house, which is just over that way. Lighting in there. But it was nice to see that when it was sunny and the leaves were not on the trees during the winter and early spring, that could often be enough to be very brightly lit in there. And the window slash door, which I showed you, I had that covered with a, um, a thick blanket it's insulation during the winter. So this was my only natural light. And it worked pretty well. It also had kind of a little passive solar effect. It, it would heat up in that space a little bit. Cool barn in the background. And maybe at this moment I should show this stream, which is just behind. I did not use this for drinking because there's some um, kind of trash and other things upriver, but I used it for washing and, um, and things like that. And recently I made a little waterfall, which then gouges out a little pool and keeps it gouged out. People will often make a dam and think upstream of the dam is going to be their swimming or, or dipping pool, but that fills in with sediment. If you make a waterfall, it gouges out an area, assuming that it doesn't hit bedrock or huge rocks that it can't move. Here we are in the front again, and I should make note of this A-frame that I added to the front and covered with the same plastic. I made this as kind of a mud room, transition space, protected area, so that way things I wanted to store um, did not get rained and snowed on, and likewise, I didn't when I entered and exited. Alright, let's go in. As you can see, there's just a bungee cord holding the door window, and it helps squeeze it up against the reed and cattail frame I made. So I've opened the door and turn the light on inside. There's where the electric outlet and cord is. I'll just sit down outside and describe from here for the time being, and then we'll go inside and talk about what can be seen from there. This was the ground level, the natural ground level, and I dug down because the inner frame is 12 foot diameter, meaning that the highest point is only six feet tall. I'm six feet tall, so I wanted space to be able to stand comfortably and feel spacious. So this is dug down two feet. I would have some 
a foot and a half or two above me when standing anywhere in this zone. And um, I used boards from pallets that were freely available and as a retaining wall and supported by these red maple stakes. That's the five gallon sawdust toilet, the compost, I like to call it, and would also put food scraps in there. And I have a compost pile out in back of the wigwam. This is the part of the rocket mass heater. This is the bed that the ducting goes through, full of mass and rocks and clay and sand. And this is the beginning of the combustion chamber. I'll show a better view and talk more about that once I'm inside and seated there. On the left, we can see where those black walnuts are is where I just store things. This recessed into the earth would stay about 40 degrees, I'd like it would be my refrigerator, even when the inside was being heated and much warmer. This is water from the stream that I would use for hand washing and dish washing, and I'd use that, that pot to help with that, and then just dump it into this bucket. And that's also where I would um, dump the collected condensate from the heater system, then when that filled, I would bring it outside. And this is where my kitchen supplies and kitchen wares would be. Okay, I'll give you a best of a panorama as I can show from this angle before I go inside. To get your bearings here, here we are at that seat I pointed out. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't smell at all. Remember I said the compost is under it, but with enough sawdust um, it really doesn't, it really doesn't smell. So I'll review the stuff on the right before we talk about the heater. Oh, this is the window that I pointed out from the outside. And like I said, even without electric light sometimes, um, with the leaves off the trees when it was a sunny day, it'd be pretty bright in here, even though I had this window door fully covered in an insulated blanket. So once again, that's the refrigerator during the winter. That would be my freezer, AKA outdoors. Play a little tune for you. <laughs> Does anyone know what that is? What that song is? It's a bit cleaner in here. Yeah, I know, it doesn't... <laughs> neater, I should say. Maybe it's, it's not clean, but it's neater and less things in here than it was when I was living in it. Let's get to the exciting part. The rocket mass heater. Rocket mass heaters are awesome. This is something you can easily research and find great diagrams and videos and uh, all about these. And it's basically a modern take on masonry heaters where the fire does a convoluted path through hundreds of pounds of mass and exhausts relatively cool, meaning that so much of that heat has been stored in the mass and it acts as a buffer, slowly radiating that heat out into your space well after your fire has gone out. In the case of this one, that brick and wood is covering a hole that goes down a foot that's where sticks and pallet pieces and wood would be um, standing vertically. Air gets sucked vertically down a foot. The sticks, the wood burns at the bottom. The fire goes horizontally sideways about two feet. And then it goes vertically about three and a half feet inside that bucket. In my case, I used fireproof high heat um, insulation, uh, ceramic fiber blankets. Made a cylinder of it um, with six inch inner diameter and it raises up, creates such a strong draft, it goes almost to the inner ceiling of that barrel. I could cook on top. I made that simple aluminum foil shroud so that way it would cook, um, bring a pot to boiling much, much faster. And, and then it, the exhaust gases and heat descends in a hollow ring, the inside of the barrel, but um, downwards.
and then in this mass is six inch ducting about six feet this way it curves a foot and a half and then 90 degree again about eight feet to way back there curves again behind the barrel and then curves again 90 degrees but up and I could hold my hand to that even an hour at any point before after during the heat um, having a fire and then new exhaust and somewhere in this video I'll show you a picture of during one of the burns during the winter just how clean that exhaust looks it doesn't look like smoke it looks like steam and that's what other people say with a efficient fire um, that's all you see with an efficient um, rocket stove or rocket mass heater burn. These red ropes were not structural. They were just as a kind of safety to, well, one, to help me get up and down. Not that I need the help, but nice to give a boost because I, I had to build this heater quickly. It was getting really cold, so I just started building it on grade. And I would have liked it to be lower down so that way the cooking area was more accessible. Um, I pretty much have to reach up a little bit above my head, or at eye level is there when I'm standing. Um, but also if I'm leaning into the, the look in the fire hole, um, this gets really hot. I burn my arms a couple times, so I put these up so I could just reach back or, or grab onto that to give myself support and pull back. In the back is where I'd keep the busted up pallets and other wood. And um, Waxed cardboard is an amazing fire starter. I should recommend that, and that's where I keep that stuff back there some wood up top to um, to dry out if, if I wanted especially dry wood. So through the winter and spring there was no bugs in here, no molds, no mildew, um, just some mice in the walls. I caught a couple and then they seemed to learn not to come more interior than the walls so that was fine. But as it got warmer outside, the warm humid air comes into contact with this cooler, um, the cooler surfaces in here and condenses. But you also see this kind of mildew is forming. And if I was to have burns every day in here or so, or, or maybe less, it would keep it dry in here and warm. But I have no need to be doing that. And I'm cooking and living in another space during this time of year, so um, this place is just building up some, some mildew, so maybe I should do something about that. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. But anyway, like I said, this was a, this project was quick and easy and cheap and natural and simple and DIY and, uh, inspired by primitive architecture and indigenous architecture, I mean, and... It was humble and simple and can be built so many places and low impact and I wanted to be comfortable and uh, successfully live through a cold winter here and I did it and through the spring and we'll see how it goes if I want to live in it again next winter. Okay, I wanted to include a little bit more about the rocket mass heater. Um, like I said, there's there's plenty of videos and things you can see online to tell you more about these and illustrations, if you're not familiar, illustrations um, that will make it much clearer. But I'll just pull this off. Basically a foot down is this hole that's made with bricks. This is called cob. It's just the right mix of clay and sand moist and it acts like cement and I just pushed a bunch of rocks in because I had them and that's what all of this material is made of too as well as a lot of rocks in there so this is where I would sleep and I'd put down right back there you can see a, a layer of plastic I would put plastic over this and that would prevent the, the condensation or the, the capillary rise, maybe is the term for it, of the groundwater 
from getting into where I would sleep. So I could have put plastic underneath this and that would have prevented that, but I didn't want to. So this is where the sticks would go, whether they're small ones like that or big ones. Sometimes I had sticks um, sticking up like this high and the air gets sucked down, wood burns at the bottom, goes sideways. goes sideways and then the insulated um, chimney in the center of this is where the the chimney effect and draft happens and, and then that's what pushes it through a lot of the system but then I should point out also that originally at this juncture remember after it goes through all of this bedding at this juncture I originally had it exhausting horizontally out that way it did not work very well <laughs> it worked but this this is my first time building one and I think it went very well but the the this three and a half or four uh, three and a half feet of um, insulated inner chimney riser can push the exhaust through some horizontal ducting um, flue but not this much and the air would want to come in sometimes and I'd get puttering and sputtering and 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 it would smoke back sometimes so when I switched this vertically boy what a difference it just it just rushes it never smokes back the only exceptions are if I haven't burned it if I haven't run the heater in days and it's gotten cold something with the temperature outside and inside and the mass here then until the heater gets kind of warmed up and is, is being used daily or every other day um, it may be a little finicky but if you have that routine going through the winter spring the cold half of the year it um, it runs great While I was running it and cooking, it would get, here's a thermometer up there, it could get to 130 up there often, 120. And remember, I'd have the insulated um, blanket there. And, um, and then back here at around head level and maybe 100 degrees down my feet because of the earth, it'd be about 40 or 45. And this would be about 40 degrees too before a burn. I hadn't run the heater in a while. Um, but one day when I had two burns in the day, it got to 90 degrees. And then in the morning, it might be 60 degrees, and inside here, whereas during the winter, not running the heater, it might, it would drop to like a 40 degrees, like the earth, it would stay in the morning, you know, 8, 9, 10 hours after the burn, it might be 55 degrees, often. Okay, thanks for watching. Please ask me any questions you have in the comments below.